Hello everyone, today we talk about Welsh infantry from the 11th to the 13th century. I already made a video about 14th century Welsh infantry. And this video is part of the military unit series for which we will basically focus um, quite simply, really also because the pictures we have are relatively few, at least the copyright free ones that I can use. Um, uh, there was not much variety in the theme, at least to, in terms of military essentials, about Welsh uh, infantry. We rely fundamentally on the uh, Welsh, the 12th century Welsh manuscript of the Laws of Highwell, and an English record book uh, dated to the, the very end of, of the 13th century called simply Chapter House Liber A. Um, which, uh, uh, at least as iconographic sources, then there is naturally else from a you know, historiographical point of view about Welsh troops that were mostly infantry. We'll look a bit at the setting, of course. So today we do not speak necessarily of tactics, which are, however, always intertwined, but we'll have to obviously just make some consideration out of the, you know, the weapons that we will be describing, and of some broader political and strategic context, that is to say, culturally speaking, also, why did the, the Welsh fight the way they did, etc. So, if you check that 14th century Welsh infantry video I made, fundamentally not much changed um, throughout all these centuries. We're talking about the Celtic fringe, so areas that were relatively a bit um, out of the area of main development of Western art of war. And that, however, held out consistently uh, uh, for mostly for Wales until the, the 13th century, but up to the uh, also the, the following centuries there were further attempts of autonomization. In any case, we're looking fundamentally at um, Anglo-Norman times. Uh, and as we've seen also in, in other videos about the English monarchy during the same period, of course, Wales was deeply involved in this kind of um, resistance against not, not not much just the you know the Anglo-Norman lords that had settled there, but very often in this kind of midland uh, merchant, let's say, um, uh, kind of resentment towards the uh, Saxon South, towards monarchic rule, right, and so contexts of general of frontier were uh, raiding uh, warfare skirmishes etc were basically the norm um, and that however in Wales were are more directly marked by the environment by the terrain that is pretty rugged and forested especially at this time somehow uh, inhospitable Right, so it, it's similar to other scenarios that we've seen in, uh, like in Scotland or in, in Ireland. There was a general process of encastellation from which the Anglo-Norman lords fundamentally ruled, and they irradiated also some kind of military uh, innovation. Uh, but the hardcore of these populations remained fundamentally backward but not mm, much uh, easier to to curb um uh, uh throughout throughout all this this period right the reason being naturally that this being peripheral areas were also like so less after by by the english that mostly it's only during the 13th century uh, having lost m most of their uh, french um, continental possessions uh, tried to, to compact the, their power, especially in Wales, and then the, the wars uh, in Scotland. Also, some further expansion in Ireland. Uh, I made lots of videos actually about all these countries during the, the Middle Ages overall, but we still have to descend in the details of that all. And Welsh infantry uh, during the say the, the High Middle Ages, the Late Middle Ages, mostly remembered for its um, of course, it, it's a roughness, um, mostly as um, um, specializing to, to, to forms of fighting. It are also essentially the most basic and obvious: this the spear uh, and and the bow, right? And there is much to, to say about that because, of course, the, the Welsh had their own heavy cavalry, lighter cavalry, 
other types of troops, heavy infantry, say heavier infantry, etc. But overall, given that they didn't have so much surplus, of course, most of their troops were uh, homogeneously mm, more primitive somehow. And this was reflected also in their uh, tactics and uh, and strategies overall, Uh, the the especially uh, Wales and Ireland never produced um, forces that could quite regularly meet uh, in open field um, with with the Anglo-Normans successfully. It did happen at some point, interestingly enough. Uh, and however, we have also very few details about um, uh, the the tactics employed, with, especially for the Welsh. We, we start at least as battle formations. I mean, we start focusing a bit better only from the the very end of the spirit, kind of the the end of the 13th century. Um, and naturally, we will expand over time in some depth because I have really lots of stuff about. Um, British warfare during these centuries, and of course uh, there are specific sources, Geraldus Cambrensis naturally that also left us with some of the greatest, um, say, positive prejudices towards um, not much the Welsh did per se, they were definitely fierce fighters um, and so on, but also a bit of a, uh, some, um, um, not really exaggerations, but exceptions that by later historiography was, were pictured a bit like the norm such as the idea, for example, that um, the Welsh were more about spearmen in the north of their land and archers in the south, right? Which is, a, which is an idea that I, I read, even some kind of contemporary historians think literally as, you know, essentially a southern Welsh folk, just as archers or prevalently as archers, as if that was just a viable way of fighting in the first place. And just because we have this minimal evidence, people use this almost skepticistic attitude for saying, if nobody else has said we cannot understand, um, we can't say literally more about how these um, people spoke, well, it doesn't make any sense. Of course, a Welsh army was typically mostly about infantry, heavy infantry in the form of spearmen, a consistent part of lighter troops, so archers would be kind of the most typical um, type, you know, kind of the, uh, say, the, the medieval world, the, the lower strata of the population. Um, and uh, then they would have, as we were saying before, also an elite of heavy cavalry. It was a, a process of normalization, of, um, of rapid development. Like, of course, the, the, the very elite of these peoples had the same identical equipment of the English, for obvious reasons, like the entire Europe, independently from what existed in this middle ground, as a broader average, uh, reflecting the development of the land, had their own elite, which technically, technologically, was but like everyone else. Right? They could be more or less rich, affording... Uh, the, this this panoply is more or less frequently than, than others. We've seen it with the, with Scotland, with with the Irish, and so on. Um, but fundamentally, standing out for this more like, traditional way of war, right? That in, in many ways also was was closer before the Norman conquest, naturally, to the Anglo-Saxon one, right? The Welsh were by Anglo-Saxon standards before the con before the Norman conquest. Um, some, somehow, in fact, lighter than the same Anglo-Saxons, right? That when fighting in Wales, uh, basically um, began to, to employ uh, lighter gear, more skirmishing tactics and things like that to cope better with um, these uh, forces, mostly resorted to, to guerrilla, right? Uh, the sources are pretty clear, telling us how this, this people fought, and again, it's the typical image of those who can control, say, the mountains, the forests, uh, can disperse easily uh, across all these paths and so on. They, they can't control most of the, at least of the, uh, of the open plains, like with more fertile areas that would be, you know, the ideal place for a Norman pattern to install a castle in order, and, you know, just to, to rule over the local population. Um, which, again, given the fact that uh, the English had, and or their, their, monarchy the ruling dynasties had much more you know appealing um, 
lands to to grab at some point, especially in France, f from which they they came, um, and prefer to to leave. By the way, um, this area remained um, say uh, developed more gradually, right, and with with consequence also of having a, a lesser grip on the countryside on the interland, and thus letting these uh, communities also. Uh, carrying out guerrilla raids um, uh, and our stuff, right? So the 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 roughness involved uh, in this local uh, warfare is is pretty high, right? This is typical of the Celtic French, right? And we will at some point also compare a bit what were the differences between the the Welsh, the the Irish, the Scots, because are they are relevant, right? They're they're three substantially different countries, right? You also know that. Wales was essentially the one who was fundamentally integrated within uh, the English kingdom uh, and thus was kind of less diverse uh, than, than than the other, than the rest of the French just the closest to England, the, the most um, easily colonizable, let's say and I hope to restart the series about English monarchs because we're arrived exactly at Edward the, th the first right, so and there are lots of interesting stories about, in fact, also the role of uh, of the Welsh in the English armies, as you know, also in the wars of Scottish independence, this the story of, of the long, but we will talk about that because that's mostly a myth, actually. Like, the Welsh, per se, had practically and literally nothing to do with the um, development of English um, longbow, say, combined arms with, with, heavy, with Bennett arms, um, tactics, right, and or at least there were lots, of course, of Welsh archers in the English armies at, at this point, given that uh, the English had campaign, had subdued uh, mostly mostly the country at this point, and could draw um, forces from there, but there is no evidence whatsoever, on the contrary, we have the opposite uh, if anything, that Welsh archers were anything better or worse than their English counterparts actually the English archers were paid more, right? And some of them were quite famous, especially in some, the ones living in some royal forests that, as you know, were not necessarily all forests, but, you know, so there were some woodsmen that were really pr praised within and prized within the uh, the English armies. We see it from the salaries. Admittedly, when we'll see now that the English brought the Welsh archers in, in Ireland, they, they made a, a slaughter of the uh, Gaelic infantry, because of these archers, but that's literally the only thing that we can test, like in a, in a military historical way, just except from what, in fact, Geraldus Cambrens is told regarding the feats of this Welsh weapons, we'll see now specifically, which uh, historiography has taken a bit too far uh, as to say that, I don't know, the, the Welsh were ipso facto, just because the source states that, um, which they it, it actually even doesn't, right? You know, it just says that these Welsh weapons were amazing, but it doesn't say, you know, they were better than the English ones, right? And, or, you know, in absolute terms, it was a structural difference. But technologism is a bad beast and a serious uh, problem uh, in our world, and just right now we are real realizing that we have to, to take things a bit, with a, um, a bit more of a pinch of salt, let's say. Um, uh, in any case... Um, this 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 is the idea, at least, at, at least from the stereotype of the north and the south, that most Welsh troops were made up of spearmen and archers. So the simplest equipment, uh, simplest, but don't think it, it's also somehow the most effective in terms uh, uh, costs benefits likely, right? Uh, except warfare is also about concentrating. Certain forces, certain specialties, and there, and having a broader collective train to, to combine these arms that, evidently, also in the Welsh case, were, you know, developing, because basically everything was about combined arms tactics. But that, in some cases, in the Middle Ages, could be, in fact, a bit more than a bit more ad hoc, exactly as the English would do later by cultivating further uh, longbowmen, right? Also in the English, uh, among within the the English um, peasantry and so on. Um, for what we could call in an, in anachronistic terms a, a doctrinal purpose uh, here the norm was just you know if you had to recruit mercenaries especially locally from Britain they would 
obviously mostly be something like Spearman and and Bowman, right? This was obvious also for for England, right? And aside from the greater or or uh, smaller presence of kind of kind of heavier troops um, of sort. Um, and um, again, we have mostly from an iconographic point of view the loaves of, of Hyval, the, the chapter house Liber A, um, and that that show us also pretty reliable picture uh, of uh, pictures of what an average Welsh infantryman could look like, and everything is pretty darn simple, right? As you would expect it to be. Um, so. Starting from the dress, um, something poor but practical, right? Linen shirt and drawers. Um, over these, often a uh, belted a, a woolen tunic reaching to knees or calves. Geraldus Cambrensis says pretty reliably, right? He wrote around uh, 1193 94 that the Welsh had a thin cloak, right? Um, plus the observation, which is repeated also by uh, a contemporary author, that is Walter Mapp, the fact that the Welsh vote barefoot, right, or else wore shoes of untanned leather, quote, roughly sewn together, right. So as far as their clothing, this was probably you understand that there is no armor involved. That this was their normal outfit. They didn't really need much. What they counted on was mostly their uh, their cohesion, right? As as units, as groups, right? So if they could effectively um, stick together and uh, deliver uh, to the enemy a substantial hail of arrows and trying to break them, as we'll see now, the, usually the first charge. Um, so without engaging in melee longer than necessary, especially again they were mostly unarmored, and succeeding, of course, was would be fine. Otherwise, uh, the the same sources say without too, too much um, also blame because they they actually said that they were courageous anyway. That they would simply, if they wouldn't break at, at the first charge, they would simply retreat, and say the next day they would come back fighting again over and over they were seemingly tireless again there is a bit of romanticism involved obviously such tactics are not you know the uh, if so regular not really the 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 hallmark of a particularly you know effective military culture but we have we explained the context so it was normal f for them to just um fight in ways that were mostly about actually a hard form of war so guerrilla um, uh, designed at uh, attrition and uh, not exposing themselves more than necessarily knowing how to disperse quickly um, and leaving the enemy kind of quite uh, just nervous about it and uh, unsatisfied. Um, so th this material poverty and especially for the for centuries from the 11th to the 13th like the one we, we see today is, is, is crucial. Right. This is typical of the Celtic French. And even the aristocracy was very uh, very likely hipped, right? Even the son of the Prince of Gwynedd is described as bare legged and barefoot um in eleven eighty eight. Right? And and the the source says quote he seemed to care nothing for the thorns and thistles. That is also something that of course sounds horrifying to, to our ears but technically the human body is done just to, to suffer a little bit in the first days and then developing a callus which again for people that had been a bit waited to walk through such uh, broken terrain since children barefoot was practically irrelevant but it does give you a dimension in fact in which environment these people were raised how they live Mo mostly they were I don't know, farmers, cattle owners, they, they also folk consistently against one another, so they, uh, they, they were apt to that kind of less raiding um, warfare mindset, right? They knew how to, to, to run, to, uh, 
to skirmish, to, to, to expose themselves with the, the minimum, right, and inflicting greatest damage to, to, to save, right, their resources, they, their land was uh, naturally somehow wild, so they, they had at least a, an advantage as far as coping with this, this ground uh, compared to the heavier Anglo-Norman forces that were, as you know, m mostly uh, suited for for pitch battles. Say at least grounds where cavalry could, heavy cavalry could be deployed at its fullest potential. But not only, right? Um, of course, uh, th that's the properly the implication of the same tactics, right? That you wouldn't have the strength to cope with these enemies in open field, so the context also in which you're fighting are once when the, the Anglo-Normans have less concentration of forces um, and uh, again many small clashes that however on the long run can't really be uh, a thorn in the side, not to say some, something else. Um, and um, interestingly um, the three Welsh soldiers pictured in the Liber A that are two archers and a spearman um, all wear stockings and shoes on their left legs only and uh, the point being that the right foot would be kept bare for better purchase on steep heel sides um, that were, were uh, uh, an important feature of a Welsh terrain um, and this would of course um, generally speaking you know they, they weren't also particularly happy to go barefoot just per se but uh, they would also get kind of a greater um, sensitivity to terrain also for properly carrying out what especially these lighter troops uh, were, were habituated to do for, for saving their skins like true stunts Right again, this hit and run tactics for which you have to to really perform well fast, right, and then getting the hell out of the way on again in, in uh, unspeakable, um, you know, unspeakably dangerous circumstances. It's something we have seen also among the Irish that were actually even more more savage than, than this, right? Um, Geraldus Cambrensis says that Welshmen wore their hair short and shaped it round their ears and eyes. Um, some soldiers actually had their heads shaved to avoid getting their hair tangled in low branches while moving through woodlands, which is also um, a practicality, and it tells you also, again, how frequently uh, forested uh, such um, country uh, was, just for rendering this uh, a necessity, and you all, know, you know, just for troops to, to at least rely specifically on this kind of environment more often than not. Uh, and um, the Welsh customarily shaped their chins to. Albeit many wore mustaches, which is interesting because if you think about the, the Bayeux tapestry, at least you know the Anglo-Saxons, differently from the Normans, are showed with this kind of Celtic-like, uh, still right, Brutonic mustache, and and you you find it in um, even though of course of the Germanization, but uh, the the idea that, that this kind of a fashion you see in in Britain from from ancient times, and and the Welsh still maintain it as a sort of ethnic uh, distinction, right, in a bit of a tribal way. Albeit, Geraldus Cambrensis describes Welsh spears as literally very long. These were nevertheless occasionally, quote, prone a short distance like a javelin, right? Uh, and it was said that... Um, in such case, no male armor was proof against them. It's probably an exaggeration, but there is some 
consistency to it in the sense that the spear, again, if you look at even very ancient British war, you realize that the the, the average weapon is objective with a spear. Most troops, like mostly, we see it among war bands of Celtic Europe, etc. The spear offers some distinct advantages that, unless you don't rely on tactics that are specifically mechanical, so about the Romans, we, we, we are convinced they just fought mostly with the sword, but they also use consistently spears, and historiography is pointing that out. Again, there is a simple effectiveness in this weapon that has many, uh, many provides you with many advantages. Right. First of all, if there is a strict cohesion uh, between these forces, as it was the case also in open field, where in spite of um, the, the frequent defeats against the Anglo Normans, but there was a recognition from from the other side that the Welsh were also able to stand their ground consistently. They would use the spears by fixing them on the ground when they were surrounded to just fence to keep the, the away the enemy horse. Um, so it's a quite versatile weapon. There's also importantly, say, powerful. Right, you can't cause horrendous. Well, of course, there were different types of spears, but generally speaking, this thing you can't keep the enemy at distance with. Also, because this is typical of lighter troops that do not, as you have seen, engage um, very uh, gladly in melee because they don't have m much armor to, to protect themselves. It's typical of the commoners. In fact, in the Middle Ages, but the knight would mostly close, and because. Uh, to, with shorter weapons to, to go at a range that uh, normally other troops wouldn't, because it was enough protected against also these weapons in part. Um, but the spear itself is something you can, especially on this rough terrain, say during an ambush from the steep hills, you, if you, you throw, if it's, it's a substantial thing enough, you can really cause significant damage to armor. Like in, in medieval times, in even very late medieval times, when firearms were well developed, etc. But, say, especially at close range and sieges, like, truly, the most effective weapons were still javelins and, and stones, right? Um, it, it's not about primitiveness, backwardness, it's literally physics, and it's still very relevant in, in, in many ways. So the spear was somehow the ideal weapon. You could can do a lot of things with that. You can use it over arm, under arm, throw, throw, you can throw it, and naturally there were lighter uh, spears, javelins, darts that would all concur to this kind of harassment, especially from the lighter elements, the youth, so that if you're an Anglo-Norman knight and if you catch these guys uh, in open ground, you can mow them like grass, except that they also run um, pretty fast sometimes. Um, this was the case, especially for, for, for the Irish, but also for the Welsh, this, this is documented. But if the they managed to reach a um, just a woodland, there is some kind of tree barrage or some difficult ground, stone, whatever, you, you start, you know, dislodging them from there, especially when they throw at you all this um, darts can be uh, very complicated, and given that your horse, more often than not, is not even armored, or at least it has just a comparison of some kind of padded um, armor, right? You may want to watch out, right? Because you'll see now what also was described by Giraldus famously enough regarding the fact that the penetrativity of these weapons. First of all, he said, you know, this thing again, no mail corslet could stop this the weapon. So again. Yeah, they were pretty powerful. They they could pierce mail. Um, however, I mean, also Anglo-Norman spears could do that for for that matter. So nobody understand why, especially the Welsh. With the, it is true that among the within these peoples, um, you know, the idea of specializing themselves or with some specific spear hands or. Um, other technologies, probably in damaging armor for taking out the the elite, right? Especially trying to to lure them in some uh, on some ground where they, especially the most hot-headed, nervous one, could break, uh, could get after having broken the formation, etc. Uh, because it's unnerving to cope uh, with guerrilla at that point. So they were aiming at that. It was also some kind of adjustment, perhaps, to to be more effective against armor. 
However, still, in that sense, the Anglo Normans had the technological edge. So, this doesn't explain entirely how you know it could be possible just to be uh, so confident about uh, any spear, well, most of this spear capacity to, to to penetrate any male arm. But again, they're just statements. Um, in any case, Geraldus records. Um, the men of Marionetshire and Sinan as being particularly skillful in the use of the spear such. Again, it was their main weapon. They had side ones for cutting, etc., but mostly, right, as we will see now that they had other other weapons that also didn't differ substantially from the the one commoners of other of other areas of the same England, you had just arms, you had, but prevalently, right? The spear was something uh, a Welshman was kind of more, uh, on average, confident in, in using, also for homicidal purposes than the average uh, English man at, at this point, if anything, because the Anglo Normans had somehow pacified the area, the peasants were under the lords, and the, the system functioned uh, differently, right? Um, Geraldus says that the best Welsh archers came from Gwent um, and he describes them in particular as having quote much more experience of warfare than the men from other parts of the country so basically saying that um, this area was a bit like at least the most the more uh, the more warlike one at least the more, the more active militarily speaking, then of course it's complicated to, to distinguish what, because, say, the more individuals need to be warlike and kind of less individually properly in, yeah, in, in combat and the least collective capacity there is to, to dispense then of, of that, so um, this should be evaluated through other meters, it's not just Geraldus. In any case, um, in his journey through Wales, written in 1188, the same author describes Welsh elm bows as crude, quote, rough and unpolished, yet capable of shooting at a con to a considerable distance, as well as being able to inflict deep and... Uh, Horrifying wounds at close range. Right, and there is this very famous anecdote regarding um, one of these bows shooting an arrow, um, uh, penetrating an oak door four inches thick. Also, the worst, um, an arrow once went through a horseman's mail quiz. Thigh, uh, and the skirt of his gambeson then threw his leg and tire and saddle, right, and finally penetrating deep enough into the horse's flank to kill the animal, right. So an astonishing penetration. At, at least um, this was an exceptional shot, as the author says, but it depicts quite graphically what. Um, like a, a long bow, likely a close range, would be able to do. I explained countless times that there is nothing peculiar about a long bow in any way. Um, in Europe, Western Europe, bows since prehistory are only of, of the same type. There is no variation ever. They are the same ones. The only thing that a long bow is, is a, a larger bow than the average. And it normally went at this point in parallel with, of, of course, the, the size of, of the of the of the soldier, meaning that uh, normally just bigger people would would using a bow would, would have a larger one, uh, and that's how the thing began. Uh, in many ways, I mean, in the in the recruitment systems as well, there was within the community a general understanding that say. Uh, at least somebody had to be sent also for so we don't think it just as a domination but like we need to send the best guys that 
that beat the hardness. So it's likely that if they were making kind of a rota system or a, or an elite of 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 troops to to send um, into battle they, uh, among a certain amount, they would they would pick uh, the, the the more robust ones, the youngest ones, the the unmarried ones. So it's mostly the youth. They're also, in fact, the ones who could be physically stronger. But again, it's not much of a virtue just per se. Um, mostly what matters is your level of training, especially the collective one. But in this case, like, um, archers here would be, uh, you know, more performing, at least from a strictly technical point of view, if you consider the muscular mass altogether. And how just use, of course, these people were to use the bow, because it was their way to hunt, just to, sometimes even just to, to play, um, but they relied on it daily. So this, this is part of the, the reason why, um, of course, the, the longbow was in use, mostly because, uh, I could, uh, aside from the southeast of Britain, that, of course, was more advanced, etc., but, you know, it, it turns out that this, in fact, the Midlands, the, the Celtic Fringe, etc., the North were, um, generally speaking, a bit rougher than the average, even of, of the the European one in the first place. I mean, it's just like, I don't know, in Scandinavia, you see that there are more archaism and so on. So the idea that, because the crossbow spread in Britain as well, at some point, at least Richard Lionheart is credited anecdotally to have introduced it in England, naturally it already existed. Uh, the the pigs had it uh, in, 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 during the early Middle Ages. Um, it had never died out, likely, from, from ancient times. But... Um, the the idea is that the the crossbow is also uh, you know uh, um, more of a technicality if you're habituated just with the bow on a regular basis so just to use it and you learn how to use it at a point um, uh, given if you use it for a lifetime that there, there would be naturally more uh, more archers than um, Traditionally, historically, again, before the high middle ages, as we were saying before, the the lowest rank of um, of troops in the in the general levy were to be equipped, quote, literally just with 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 quiver um, and and bow, right, or not even. So um, the 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 idea is that this kind of cheap troops you can find it in, among the peasantry so at, at best they know how to use a bow but it's pretty typical and um, given that as we've seen some of these areas were also a bit more warlike they were not so easily controlled by by London because also as we've seen there was not a, a huge pressure right the, the the kingdom of England looked much more towards France than uh, where naturally crossbows were also already significantly spread at this point then the, the British interland just per se right um, so again when the English eventually began to campaign places like Wales etc they, they found like uh, on a regular basis archers locally and they began to employ them as uh, unmasked again showing again generally speaking the poverty the fact that if they had been ruling over richer people they would have Ask for a greater amount of spearmen than than, than bowmen, right? That was the the standard because the the first cost cost definitely more than the latter. Uh, for um, plus, you rise in the social rank, the social in wealth, uh, whatever you have to provide with a horse, with, with an equipment for mounted combat and so on. Uh, so again, the Welsh begin to figure in large numbers because they have been fundamentally subjugated by the English, they are just even, they have been through that war, they have already been serving the English in part, they are cheap, and so many of them, also, presumably for a career, was also later on during the Hundred Years War, began just to enlist, more like, it was m more, more, uh, you know, more likely for, you know, for, for, for a Welsh than an English man than to, to, just to, to become a, a mercenary. Because uh, the, the Englishman had fundamentally a bit more to lose in terms of wealth, of resources, of 
of, of lifestyle than, than a Welsh, right? And this is part of the reason why also we see, oh, look, there are the Welsh, then the English developed their own tactics with the bow, etc. Well, it has basically nothing to do with the quality. At least there is no proof, no evidence whatsoever, historically speaking, that the Welsh were anything better or worse than the English at archery, right? Um, in any case, they, they served, uh, and as you know, uh, the English and also these Welsh archers within their army um, would uh, would be very important to to soften up the Scottish uh, skill turn, right? So larger masses of infantry, even there in Scotland. Why did the Scots have so much infantry? Well, because they didn't have much surplus. They they they, they were a monarchy without much of the feudal potential of the south so most people were say there were much more infantry because simply there were less people that could afford cattle right scottish cavalry not, not normally had the, the worst hand against the english one right for for these very reasons so they were just they counted what they had more so the welsh were similar as you understand and the fact that they had also this important amount of archers surely has to do with the fact aside from the skirmishes and all that with the fact that they had to wear out these financially sturdy infantries that, as we've seen, were not particularly armored, but at least with a shield, they could simply, you know, do something about hails of arrows. And that w w was designed to soften. It was a very simple game, right? Imagine a feud between the two Welsh forces mostly having, again, a brutal clash, mostly all about the first charge, a bit like the barbarians in migration here, because they didn't have much supplies, or they couldn't stay that long on the field, they they wouldn't expose themselves too much, so it was either about, it, just like the Celts, like this is something that the Celts were also more um, more famous than, than the Germans, it's a, by some degree, and this great impetus on the first charge. Right, and then it, if it failed, everything tended to fall apart. Not always, but consistently, because that that's literally the best they had, right? So today we talk about infantry. Um, for the rest, we will talk about English cavalry, and there is not much of a difference from the Welsh one, aside from again this greater, you know, this lighter equipment for instance the Welsh on average, but uh, they're pretty much the same thing, they did the same thing, again, uh, the, it would have been quite difficult to distinguish, probably just at first sight, in the 11th century, the 12th century, uh, like an, an Anglo-Norman army, especially the local, uh, let's say, from the Cambro-Normans and some Welsh, um, you know, full-blooded Welsh, uh, uh, noble retinues uh, in their armies and so on. So mm, they fought pretty much in, in similar ways, except again, the Welsh were lighter and relied mostly on this hit and run tactics and so on. Um, needless to say, that you know, in any occupation, in any situation where you have um, this hardcore that manages to to deter and to convince and to persuade uh, on the tip of the sword obviously many Welsh fought with the English against other Welsh um, so uh, the English were quick to recognize the military potential of this country from which they could draw as we've seen this important uh, pool of, of troops especially the archers cost really a few consequently lots of these Welsh men fought in the English armies of the 12th and the 13th century, uh, featuring particularly prominently in Edward I's reign, for obvious reasons, uh, given that he conquered them. Uh, and um, earlier, uh, we have the episode, uh, the aforementioned episode of the Anglo Norman invasion of Ireland, in, on the occasion of which Earl Richard de Clare inherited his father's nickname, Strongbow, because of these Welsh troops. Um, and bear in mind that the bow, as such, was not really alien 
from, as we were saying before, from just even the practice of the most noble and chivalry-minded Anglo-Normans at a point. Huh? Like, um, the official sources do not really tell it out loud, but as we've seen, the longbow cannot be used um, on on horseback. Naturally, it would have side weapons, some crossbows, but just knights dismounted consistently to on a regular basis, and every knight knew how to use a bow. Also because he knew how to use basically any other type of weapon to a very high degree of, of excellency. These were um, men raised, like, just using weapons since they were children, competing, fighting harshly, being traumatically abused, re rebuilt as, as pure manslaughtering machines, and they knew pretty damn well how to use a longbow, right? Um, which could be, uh, again, with these nicknames, also a matter of great pride, right? They would use it as a sort of, not necessarily sniper, sniping weapon, but um, in part, you know, hunting had to do with that. Um, but um, um, that is a good example. But, say, during a siege, uh, I don't know, you have somebody on the ramparts that is hiding between, you know, uh, the, the various, uh, the crenellated, um, uh, you know, defenses of an ore behind, a, uh, you know, just popping out with his head out of a window. Well, if you were able just to shoot him right through the skull with an arrow, well, it would have earned you quite a name, because naturally they were trained mostly, especially the leaders, Right, the 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 average filing rank archer was it's probably good, even in you know in precision by some degree, especially at short range for some reason for hunting, etc. But tactically speaking, the only thing that actually mattered in practice was zone fire, right? The the simultaneity of the volleys and this kind of stuff. Also, because arrows, by the way, are not infinite; they do cost, right? But as far as a commander was concerned, as he can do a bit more things along the way, uh, even though at this point he's mostly a, uh, a cavalry man, but in, in a place like Wales where you have to dismount more more often and still where lots of warfare is about position, you know, siege warfare, things like that, well, just having fun, a little bit shooting, uh, sometimes even being shot at, I mean, look at how Richard Liner died like uh, almost like a game where right? it was they were interested in this kind of um uh, fanatic bravery let's say and so they in you know, the single shots were were seen as uh, important uh, important factors by the way I just made a video I think a couple of weeks ago about exactly crossbows and longbows more or less around this time, we were talking exactly about a bit more of symbolism and meaning about arrows, but uh, bows, the the idea that it was some sort of gamble behind that, a sort of symbolism, not much in the West, but still, like the idea of, you know, the the precision of a shot determining the, the moral quality of the shooter, a bit like, especially among these uh, aristocrats. Um, and you find the name, in fact, uh, existing through the generations, also among the Scumber Normans, etc. And indeed, the fact that um, the English adopted the longbow um, on a more regular basis even than, than before, uh, during the late Middle Ages, has nothing to do with the Welsh. Right? It was a thing that already existed in in Britain, and or at least if, if it had to do with the Welsh, it was not because of some kind of uh, importation of the weapon in England, right? It, it, England had the same identical stuff around, it's just that we're likely more Welsh willing to go at war for the English just because they were poorer, and the pay seemed to them a, a bigger deal than it would seem for an average English subject. Right, so that is technically the uh, the only 
sensible thing that we know about um, Welsh archery and the and the relation with the spread of the the longbow in especially in late um, medieval English armies. There would be a lot to say about that because um, you know if you tour YouTube you find people were convinced of course of the fact that again that there was this important influence whatever but it's also the thing that interests me the most is also how more frequent dismounted warfare was in in Britain compared to continental Europe and probably the answer is not much more but at least given the Celtic fringe it is something that most western countries do not quite have you may have other fringes like I don't know in, but it's not a fringe like during the Reconquista you have troops that are enemies that are lighter etc but you know in the core of Europe you don't have an area that is so like kind of wilder where people carry out the stacks that are so kind of backward whatever so um, the idea is that the English at some point were maybe more sensitive they were more habituated at home to be facing this greater foot challenges more more than else because their opponents didn't have much cavalry in the first place there um, but if you look at the profile of 12 uh, let's say 11 12th 13th century uh, english warfare you uh, you do not truly really see mm, there are some little hints of the fact that English armies may have, may have had a slightly more foot bias, but it's practically like the peak of chivalry kind of kind of irrelevant, right? The English fought as just the exact copy of, of a French army, and they uh, there is no proof that they made any more use of of infantry than other areas, including I don't know France or Italy or Germany. Um, and we don't remember those countries much because of a greater bias just of dismounting unless again but they were all going towards a, an increase of mounted warfare so what happened later um, with the armies of Edward Edward III at least there were chances in which of course the English dismounted already before got a bit away especially fighting against the Scots is is in part due to this experience against the Scots mainly. Wales may have had something to do with that, but less importantly, because we don't find huge concentration even of, you know, in open ground of this Welsh infantry. Uh, too much of a risk. Like the Scots had a bit more of a, you know, monarchic profile, that organization of some sort, at least for, for, having this kind of greater forces functionally deployable in open field against the English and their cavalry um, but it, it's something that also during the Hundred Years War came about mostly for tactical contingencies I mean English mostly dismounted during the Hundred Years War against the French because they were dramatically inferior in number and they were defending um, so it made a lot of sense right actually a great part of them, sometimes even most of them, during the Chevauchet were mounted. They, would, they were still fighting as cavalry, right? So um, there are lots of interesting um, implications about this because we may have misread history in stereotyping, stereotyping too much how a people fights as opposed to another for some arcane reason that eventually doesn't you know doesn't even emerge from from the sources per se right so i think um at least as far as british warfare is concerned this is it's always been my take fundamentally since the beginning and i've not seen any specific reason to um to like to 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 review this right to 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 change uh that right of course uh, in any case um we will keep talking about welsh warfare again i will make a video about welsh the welsh army uh, the welsh army organization uh, 
the um, uh, Welsh tactics, of course, uh, throughout various eras, and then we will talk about Welsh battles, at least battles in which the Welsh were involved. And so this all hopefully with time, a step at a time. For, for now, uh, I think the only other video I really made about Wales uh, I oh, know I made yes I made uh, I think a couple of months ago a, a video about um, the the say English and Welsh warfare exactly around this time so um, dare I say it's something um, as well but nothing I think specifically about Wales other than this and uh, this video and the one about the 14th century Welsh I don't remember whether archer or infantrymen, um, more generally, uh, but as you can probably see, they were pretty much the same, um, except perhaps in the 14th century, a Welsh um, archer would be slightly better equipped. Right at the time, you could also simply have uh, could buy a sword without too much um, bloodletting, let's say economically wise than it was possible naturally in this earlier centuries where the thing was really 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 primitive especially uh, in the 11th right and before the final English um, affirmation in the land however for today uh, I stop it here I just hope that you enjoyed this video if you did please share it otherwise leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content as always i thank you heartily for listening to me i wish you a nice time and see you next time